right. Welcome. Why don't we go ahead and stand? We're going to pray, and then we're going to sing some worship together before we begin our study tonight. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence here tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the excitement and the opportunity, Lord, to learn from you. Lord, your design for marriage, your purpose in it, and Lord, how you glorify yourself through uh, marriage itself. And Lord, we pray through the marriages in this room and the ones that will be uh, married one day. Lord, we pray your blessing on this time. May we have your eyes to see marriage the way you do. And Lord, may we model our lives according to your word. We thank you for this time. Lord, we pray that you would receive our praises today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated. Yep, come on up. That's right, you get both of us. Yay, so excited. All right. So we're going to fill you in on what we're doing over the next several weeks. Uh, We're going to pray again, and then we're going to jump into it. So would you pray with us? Heavenly Father, we just lift up this time to you. Lord, we thank you for each and every person who is here, whether married, hope to be married, or single. Lord, we pray that our time together, God, that you would speak to us through your holy word, that tonight we would really understand the biblical design and purpose for marriage. And uh, Lord, may our marriages be built upon you. And in the coming weeks, Lord, may we continue to grow in our relationship with you and with our spouses and also in our understanding of marriage if we're hoping to be married one day. So, Lord, we thank you for our time together. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your leading. And may you bless each and every person who is a part of this study. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, um, obviously, my wife, Jen. I'm her husband, Phil. And it's nice to meet all of you. Now, we're going to go ahead and jump into a few things tonight. I'm just referencing the notes. Now, Jen knows none of this, so she's going to be flying by the seat of her pants a little bit, Um, but we'll have some questions in a moment. One thing I want you to understand about what we're doing here is uh, we are obviously experts at marriage. 25 years. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and we're still not, right? Um, Anybody who says they've got marriage figured out, they're a liar. Right? Can we agree? Um, And yet, marriage is one of the most amazing things that we get to share, and it's the foundation of human society, of culture, of the family, and of the church. Okay? And so God has a a very serious um, interest in what goes on here. So this is how it's going to go the following weeks. Jen and I are going to tag team. Uh, We're going to watch the videos in the coming weeks from The Art of Marriage. They're about 25 to 30 minutes long. And then that's going to give us the time to really engage. And really, why we decided to do this on Wednesday nights is we've gotten so many requests from couples in our church who, they're just, are there marriage resources? Is there marriage counseling? And so a lot of what we're going to do on these Wednesday nights is actually what I do with couples privately. I walk them through the scriptures. We talk about God's design for marriage and what does the Bible say about it. And we discuss how can we really apply this uh, in, in their relationships, right? So Jen and I were teasing each other quite a bit today um, about all the things that we were going to say about each other. And uh, so, um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Do you want to tell them about the books? Yes, thank you. That's why you're here. All right, so there's books. You can see Jen's going to use the microphone a lot tonight. Books, please. There, the the books. All right, so we do have workbooks for this video series. If you want to get them, um, they're what, Rosie? 20 bucks? For a set. Okay. His and hers, 20 bucks for a set. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to do the workbook. You don't have to get it. Um, if you buy the workbook, it's not benefiting us. We're not fleecing you and making money on it. It's just, we're just trying to provide the resource. I like to put it this way. If, if you're the type of person who you don't really care about the whole movie, you just want the highlights, then don't get the workbook. But if you want the full movie or the extended cut, get the workbook. And so what you put into it is what you're going to get out, okay? So I know some of you might not like to read. You might not be a workbook type of person. But if you're really serious about this, I highly recommend it. There's great resources in that, and it will provide you time, if you are a couple, to talk about your relationship, where you guys are at. Here's the cool thing. Look around and see how many people are here tonight, right? I think marriage is pretty important to us, isn't it? 
right? And everybody wants their marriage to grow, no matter how great it is, or if you're struggling or somewhere in between, this is a great opportunity for all of that. Now, our son Luke, he's 16. So what do you do when you turn 16? What's the big milestone? Driving, right? Now, I want you to think about something. Marriage is the most important relationship next to your relationship with Christ and the one least prepared for. This is what Luke has to go through. Luke has to take a 40-hour online driver's course, 40 hours, right? He has to pass that. Then he has to take the permit test, pass that, Then he has to take six hours of behind-the-wheel training and six months of driving with mom and dad to learn how to drive properly just to get a driver's license. What did you have to do to get your marriage license? Sign it. Sign it. (laughs) Sign it. Some of us didn't even put two hours into counseling or study. Can you imagine how much more prepared we would be as married couples, if we put in that much effort to our marriage license and our marriage covenant, and how much more important it is than being able to just drive a vehicle, right? So the hope is to really have a time of preparation. And so here's our questions, all right? First one, who's been married five years or less? Raise your hand. Yeah, I married some of you guys. I can see it. That's right. All right, five years or less, okay? Yeah, Alan, put your hand down. That was Rosie's husband back there. (laughs) Can we add a zero to that and it'll be closer? Right? Five years. What about 10 years? 10. All right. 10. Woo. 15. All right. There we go. I'm going to call it Matt and Lacey. They celebrated 19 yesterday. Woo. 19. Anybody in the 20, 20 group? All right. All right. What about 25? Raise your hand. (laughs) <laughs> all right, 25, all right. We're going to go now 25 and above. Raise your hand if you're 20. Okay, okay. Who's, who's at 35? Woo. Okay, we're getting high now. 40. What? Okay, 40. 50? Yeah? 59 right here. All right, so you guys are the experts. 59 tomorrow? Oh, happy anniversary. I see you took your wife out on a hot date tonight. Good job. That's the secret, guys. Come to church, and that's how you make 59 years. All right, now how about this? To those of you who are married, if you're brave enough to answer, why did you get married? (laughs) Matt Levins, we know your answer already. (laughs) <laughs> we could all guess Matt's answer right now. All right, anybody else? <laughs> yep. That's right. So to not lose him and separate, you had to follow him here. I like it. That's amazing. How old were you when you got married? Woo. Yes. All right, next. Why did you get married? Don't say I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> All right, Debbie. Got it, Mary. I was 18. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just asked him. I said yes. Clue what that meant. Okay, For you loved day. each other, but you had no yeah. clue what that meant. Yeah. That's very, I mean, that, that's absolutely good and insight. In the back? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Anybody else? Why did you get married? Nice. It's nice having parents who will set an example like that. That's awesome. All right. How about, I have another question here. Those who are currently unmarried but want to be, why do you want to get married? (laughs) are we talking people out of marriage tonight is that what we're doing that was good that was good anybody that see that's a little more like you're putting yourself out there anybody 
We're just going to keep moving on. I'm going to start calling out names. <laughs> you won't. I won't let I him. see people shrinking in their seats. All right. How about, I might not get anybody on this one. Now, if you're single and you don't want to get married, why? Okay, that is, that is a very honest answer, and it's not uncommon. Thank you. I appreciate that honesty. That's awesome. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yep, that's a biblical word, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're all about biblical terminology here. Bob. <laughs> okay, okay. The question was is if you're single and you don't want to get married, why? Um, yep. Yep, for sure. And so is it possible that our past experiences and hurts we've gone through can shape how we view marriage? Absolutely, right? Absolutely, but we want to make sure we get a biblical view of marriage. That's really what we're about tonight. Hopefully, that's going to help. Um, now, we're going to have a trailer for the videos. It's going to come up, and we're going to just watch it for a moment. And then tonight, I'm going to actually go into uh, what God's Word says about marriage. I'm going to try to cover quite a bit of material. It is it, the main passages I use in counseling. It's Genesis, a portion of Genesis 1, a portion of Genesis 2, and Genesis 3. And then Ephesians 5. I mean, just light work, right? <laughs> All right, so we're going to go ahead and watch this, so listen up. Lead us spiritually and always be patient and be kind. And she got it. <laughs> <laughs> I just had this idea we'd be best friends. We'd have lots of sex. And we'd play <laughs> we'd video, play video games. games. That's, not, yeah. that's all you yeah. need in a marriage. Yeah. So, that, so that didn't end up happening. You always marry the wrong person, and that's for a couple reasons. One is that, that God, his intention is for you to learn to love somebody that's different. Um, second, they change. If you're married to one person over a lifetime, you're actually married to five different people. So if they're the right person now, they're not going to be the right person tomorrow. Love is not simply a feeling. Love is not simply making someone feel good. Love actually looks like the cross. There's no such thing as true love unless there's sacrifice. Love in the scriptures means that I disadvantage myself for the comfort and benefit of another. The purpose for oneness is so that people can see modeled in your marriage the same kind of oneness that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have experienced for eternity. And your marriage, even in its imperfections and flaws, may be the most powerful statement for the gospel of Jesus Christ some people ever see in their entire lives. All right, so there's a lot in that video, it's very short, that we like, and there's one part we don't like at all. Did all right. Pick up on it? It was a strange statement. Right, right. Yeah, the, I, and I think in that pastor's defense, I think he was trying to be clever. Yeah. Right? Um, but he said, you always marry the wrong person. And then he goes on to say that the person you marry ends up growing and changing. So it's like you, you're married to like five different people. <laughs> that one person is like five different people through the life of your marriage. Yeah, okay, yeah. We change but to say that you marry the wrong person and be that, that be the statement, I think if God and his sovereignty allowed you to marry that person, that is the right person, right? That's the person you're called to love and you're to give yourself to and sacrifice for and submit to, like, so there's that. But the last one, the last statement, that's, that's the guy who leads family life. I think it's Dennis Rainey. And for him to say that your marriage might be the the best expression of the gospel anybody will ever see, right? And that's really hinting at the purpose of marriage, that honestly, our marriage, the goal is not Jen's happiness or mine. Happiness comes and goes. 
but it is that we would be one, as I talked about in the video, and to the point that people would see Jesus and his love relationship with the church modeled in our life. And he also says that... I'm not sure. Go on. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I wasn't bringing... <laughs> He also says, though, that your marriage and all of your struggles, um, he doesn't just say the best time of your marriage is a good example, right? He says your struggles. And so how you go through those struggles, how you lean into one another, um, how you walk side by side could be one of the best examples that somebody would ever see of Christ. Absolutely. Yep. All right. Get out of here. (laughs) She's excited to sit down right now. (laughs) <laughs> Dead ass. I didn't pay him to say that. Go ahead and take out your Bibles if you have them, your Bible app, whatever you got. Um, we're going to look at Genesis 1 to start. Um, and there's four things I like to focus on with couples when I sit down with them. That's the design of marriage, the roles in marriage, the conflict in marriage, and the purpose in marriage. All right. So those are kind of the four things. And we're going to see, and if God created marriage, it's for his glory and for the gospel to be seen. I think it makes sense that the creator of that institution is the one who knows how it functions best, right? And the problem that we have in our culture and our society is the world has a very different view of marriage, right? Can we agree? Biblical marriage and what God has designed and what he's laid forth in the scriptures is almost opposite, to be honest, of what the world promotes, right? The world promotes people falling in and out of love. And if, well, if you just fell out of love, then that's your way out, okay? That in no way is a biblical concept. The falling into love and falling out, it's no, I've chosen to love you and I continue to choose to love you. That's the marriage covenant. Uh, But it's something that there is this idea that the world, and and really it's a result, if we're honest, of uh, the feminist movement, Um, unfortunately, as I mentioned before, women have been mistreated throughout world history. Uh, And I think largely because in Genesis 3, as we'll see possibly tonight, God gave the first gospel message to Satan and said that there would be a woman and the seed of that woman, that child would crush the serpent's head. That that would be his demise and his ultimate defeat because of a woman and a child. So what has Satan done throughout world history? used wicked, ungodly men to abuse and take advantage of women and children. Okay, so we've seen that. Now, unfortunately, you have a situation in our country where women were not given the rights that they should have had, and that has been a process of gaining those rights, even voting rights, but what ended up happening is now it became a situation where men and women are equal in every category. They're exactly the same. Now, biblically, we would say men and women are of equal value, but complementary roles and giftings, okay? They're a complement. If your spouse is exactly like you, I'm willing to bet your marriage is not functioning well, okay? We are different. Male and female, just that alone makes us different. Now, you need common ground. You need to have a same biblical view and a unity in the faith, but that's something that the complementary nature of marriage is what we need. So here's the world's way. 50-50 partnership. Find that in the Bible. It's not. Because that's a business transaction. That's uh, an exchange of goods. You do this service for me and I'll do this service for you. I go and do this as long as you're doing your part. If you don't do your part, then I'm not going to do my part. See how that doesn't work? It's like a break of contract. And yet the Bible's concept is that the husband over here does everything God calls him to do to the best of his ability, no matter what his wife is doing. And in the same way, the wife is doing everything God has commanded in his word, even if her husband is not. It is a hundred hundred. It is a team aspect. And isn't it interesting that Satan would love to convince couples, married couples specifically, that your spouse is your opponent. That they are the reason why you're not happy. They're the reason why you haven't done this in your life or done that, or they're constantly squashing what you're wanting. 
Satan would love you to hold that view. Instead of seeing that they are your helper and helpmate, they correspond to you. You are teammates with the same purpose, the same mission that God has given you, and you're to do it together, right? It's not my things and her things. It's not what I want and what she wants. It's our things, who we want. And that's why, and I'll just use this as an example, I try to encourage couples in premarital counseling, if they have separate money in every way, and they're married and they have separate accounts, and I pay for this and you pay for that, that never, never really works out well. There has to be trust. Now, you can have your own, okay, I'm going to set aside money here, you're going to set aside money here and work together towards a unified purpose and the use of money. But when somebody's like, nope, I have money and you have your money. I work and make this money. You work and make that. I'll pay the mortgage. You pay the electricity. You're now roommates, right? It's not really unity. There's not the trust and, and the sharing of things. So we got to make sure we understand what it means to be one. Now let's look at Genesis 1, 26. This is where we get down to the design of marriage. You know we're going to creation. We're going to see who was created first and why and for what purposes. So we're going to jump right to Genesis 1.26. This is day six of creation. God has created the earth and, and light and vegetation and animals and all these things. And now the high point of creation on day six is humanity. So verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So God's image, who God is and how he has revealed himself. He is best represented, not by a man, not by a woman, but man and woman together. Your goal as a parent is to show your kids what God is like. And God is best represented when mom and dad are walking with Jesus, modeling his life, and the children get to see aspects of what God is like. That is where the image of God is most clear. Male and female in marriage walking with Jesus. Now we're going to see here, verse 28, God blessed them and God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Let's just look at God's command to man and woman. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Isn't that the opposite of what certain people in the world are saying today? Don't be fruitful. Don't have kids. Don't fill the earth. We're using up all of its resources. It's going to go away. It's actually the exact opposite of what God said to humanity. God said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And yet the world wants you to believe that, nope, you can't have enough kids. You need to stop having kids because there's not going to be enough resources for everybody. I think God knows how to handle resources, don't you? Right? So he goes on. God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the heavens, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food and it was so. And God saw that everything that he had made and behold, it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Now, I want you to know, this is the only time a perfect marriage ever existed. And it was very short. It didn't last very long. According to Scripture, it seems like it was maybe the next day. It was probably longer than that. But that was the only time marriage existed in a state of perfection. And it goes south real quick, biblically. And some of you might have experienced that. You know, we have these expectations of marriage where it's like you go through your dating, you go through your engagement, you get married, you have the honeymoon, and happily ever after. And yet, having had the privilege of getting to know various couples and what they've gone through, I know that for some, the honeymoon wasn't very much like a honeymoon. Some had some real hurts that happened on the honeymoon. 
that they've carried their entire marriage, never been healed from. Or after the honeymoon, they get back and suddenly it's like, wait, there's responsibilities. We have to share life together. What, you don't brush your teeth? Like, who knows what it is, right? Don't look at your spouse. That's messed up. But here's the thing. Sometimes it goes south real quick. And then it's like, how do we, how do we reconcile this? Do you think there's a reason why the gospel talks about forgiveness and grace? You think you're going to have opportunities to show grace and forgiveness to your spouse? Yes, that perfect man or woman you married, you find out is not perfect. Neither are you. And out of an imperfect relationship, God glorifies himself, right? And so that's what we learn and we go through. Now, let's look at Genesis 2.4. Now, that's the first account of creation. Now, I've heard people read Genesis 1. They go to Genesis 2, and they're like, wait a minute. How how does this make sense? We just heard about creation, and now God's creating man again. Just so you know, Eastern literature, sometimes they tell the big story, and then they tell the same story again and focus in on one part. So Genesis 1 is the big account of all the things God made in those six days. Resting on the seventh. Genesis 2 is now focusing on God's creation of man. All right? So we're going right to basically day six, God's creation of man and what it looks like. It's a more specific view. So look at Genesis 2.4. This is where we're going to really get into man and woman's roles. Genesis 2.4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Here's the setting and the context. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Okay, so that is how God created man from the dust on the sixth day. Now look at this. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So God gave man a context and a location to live, to enjoy God and what God has made, right? And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now you hear the dun, 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 right? Because we know what happens in Genesis 3. But right now, jump to verse 15. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Please take note of this. If you are single, you hope to get married one day. Here is my advice to any single person, specifically the men. Notice, you got to get a job before you marry the woman. Right? Don't live off the woman. Okay? God gave man a duty, a job, and a mission before she was ever created. God wanted him to be responsible with the things he had given him first. Because if Adam couldn't take care of some animals, he's not going to be able to take care of his wife. Make sense? So God commanded him, gave him the opportunity to enjoy life and the good things God has given, but God is putting him in that garden to work it and keep it. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, here's the commandment, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat it for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Please take note of this because it's going to come up again in a moment. God gave Adam a mission. God commissioned him for it. God gave him one command. The woman wasn't there yet. So God delivered his word to the man, okay, on what he was to do in the garden. Now keep that in mind. Now we get to the the apex of creation, the high point. It was not the man. It was the woman. She was the last thing created. She's also the reason why the first piece of poetry was ever written by man, okay? Men, when they see that beautiful woman, 
That's what songs and poetry issue forth from the male heart and life. It's that seeing your bride coming down the aisle and all the joy and expectation that is there. That was one of the greatest moments of my life when Jen and I got married. It was that moment when she was ready to walk down the aisle. I caught a glimpse of my bride and she was no joke bouncing down the aisle. She was so excited to come down to me. She was, she, but half the time she was just, hey, waving at everybody who was there. And I'm just like zeroed in on her like she's mine, right? But that moment, it's sacred, it's holy. You don't forget it, right? And, it, and it's important. But here you have this situation where the woman comes on the scene. Genesis 2.18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Do you realize that is the first time we have record of God saying something wasn't good? In creation, everything was good, 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 very good when he created man and woman. But here in this account, God said it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. That word fit means corresponding to. Made in like manner, they fit together. Um, I, I can't help but think about my wife and how she has communicated what God's design for marriage and the sexual relationship should be because our world has a very different idea of that, doesn't it? Right? And so when you have the rise of homosexuality and all the other um, aberrant relationships that are out there, ungodly, you have to explain to your kids how God designed things to work. So a great way to teach them how sexual intimacy works is Legos. <laughs> right? Jen's like, look, these two pieces don't fit. These two fit. You know what? All our kids understand it really well. <laughs> right? So very simply, corresponding and made for and fitting together is God's design for man and woman. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. This is the most important aspect of creation right here and man's authority in creation is that God gave Adam the right to name the animals. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because God is the one who named Adam. Adam means man. God gave him that, ma that name. So God is the one with the authority over Adam. Adam belongs to God because God named him. Now you have man being given the God-given right to name the animal kingdom. And so God ended up parading the animals in front of him day after day. Uh, the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Notice the fish weren't mentioned because he probably didn't see them, right? He, they weren't jumping out of the water. He's like, there's a salmon and there's that. That was an unexplored region of the world, right? But in the garden and the land animals that were there and the birds, he's naming all of these. And, and here's the importance of the name. When you have a child, who has the right to name that child? The parents, the mom and the dad. Now, when Jen and I, when our kids were in foster care, okay, before we adopted them, this was really driven home to us and was very special in this process because as a foster parent, you can't, call them a different name. You can't name them. They don't belong to you. They're not yours yet. So much so that if we wanted to cut their hair, we had to ask permission from social services. You couldn't cut their hair because you, weren't, you didn't have the authority to do so. But when we adopted each one of our kids, guess what we had the authority to do? Name them. And people have asked, well, why did you change their names? because they're ours, because they belong to us. And we want their names to reflect God's calling and God's design for their life. And so we named each one of our five kids because God gave us the authority to name them. Adam has the authority to name the animals. And you know who he ends up naming next? 
He gave his name to his wife. When you have authority, our world doesn't understand what authority means. It doesn't mean that you get to boss them around and tell them what they need to do for you. It means you are the one responsible to care for them, to protect them, to love them and die for them. That's what authority means. And that's what the man was called to do. He was going to care for this woman the way God called him to. That was God's design. And God gave him the right to name her. And so what ends up happening, verse 21, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Now, keep this in mind. We don't know how many days Adam was looking at animals and naming them. But it was a long time. Can we agree? And so he's seeing all these animals, right? All these animals. And it says that Adam, um, in verse 20, the man gave names to all livestock, to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So this is what he saw. Male giraffe, female giraffe. Names them. Male lion, female lion. Names them. Oh, there's a pattern. Male tortoise, female tortoise. Hard to tell, but they're different, right? <laughs> Keep going through all of the animals, and suddenly Adam's like, well, that kind of stinks. Like, every animal has their corresponding person. One, where's mine? Don't you think God was building the need? God was showing him, like, look, you're, you're missing something. But don't worry, I've got something amazing for you. It's going to blow your mind, right? Just, just go to sleep for a little bit. Don't worry about it. Adam wakes up, he's like, ah, somebody just sold my organs on the black market. <laughs> like, what happened? Where? And then all of a sudden, you know, whatever music was alive at that time, God brought her to the man. This is the first father bringing his daughter to the man. And here, God, here she is in all of her beauty, all of her wonder. And I mean, she had to look like the greatest thing he's ever seen because he's just been looking at animals, right? So he, I mean, he's excited. And now he, he just, poetry comes to mind. This at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, Jen and I didn't do a lot of mar premarital counseling. But we did some with this pastor named Pastor Carl McCauley. Awesome guy. And he had the like Southern black preacher vibe. Like he went for it, right? And he was like, the Lord said. And he had that. So we're sitting in his office and he gets to this part and he goes, Phil, Jenny, I want you to know, Adam wasn't like, oh, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. I, I could hear his voice every time. He was like, no. Adam's like, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Like, Adam is like over the top excited for this gift that God has given him. And so now you see that God created man and woman to be that ultimate gift to one another. But don't think for a moment that the ultimate love and joy and peace is, is solely to be found in that person. Because anybody who has tried to put that type of requirement on their spouse, that type of expectation, it's unfair to the spouse. They'll never meet that level of expectation. I know I haven't made it, reached it, provided that for my wife in all the ways she's needed. That's where the Lord comes in. The Lord is the source of your love, your peace, your identity, your joy. And when you expect and receive that from him, it now frees up your spouse to not have to meet that need fully. And then you can fully love them, free to love them without these un unnecessary and unrealistic expectations on another person. And let's be honest. Why do married couples argue and fight? Unmet expectations. Unmet expectations about time. Time off. How we're going to use our free time. 
why are you smiling? I mean, that's a thing, right? The most valuable thing you have in this life is your time and where you put it says something about the things you love most. Time. Or unrealistic expectations about money. How it's to be used. What goals do you have as a family? Where is it going? What are we going to spend it on? I mean, does every married couple, are they raised with the same concept of money? Usually it's opposite. You got a saver, you got a spender. Don't look at each other. (laughs) Right? I mean, that's just usually how it goes. Now, two people can be good with money and be married together. That's great. Or you could learn to be good at money together. Right? What about unrealistic expectations of physical contact and intimacy? Couples never argue about that, right? The three things couples argue about the most is time, money, and sex, right? And yet in all of it, deep down, we all want to be on the same page. We want to be valued, respected, cherished, and loved. That's what, that, that's what everybody's after. And we find it in Christ first. And then when we receive it from the Lord, we can then give it out. The problem that we run into in marriages is we're always taking account of if we're getting what we need. And if we're not getting what we need, then we can get bitter and we get resentful and we start getting short-tempered and then we're not kind and all these things can happen in the relationship. But when was the last time you thought through, I wonder if my spouse is getting everything they need from me. I wonder how they're feeling right now. I know I'm stressed out, but what about them? Are they stressed out? Do they have a lot on their plate? Is there anything I can do to remove that instead of looking at the other person as a means to get your load lighter? Now, if we're working together, I'm looking out for Jen. She's looking out for me, and it's a beautiful teamwork. But the minute we start looking to our own interests and not the interest of the other person, that's when things start to degrade right? We can all all relate to that. But here you have the role of marriage, and there's a lot here that we can look at. Um, One of the things, I found this quote, the biggest trick of the modern world was making women believe working eight hours a day for a stranger and leaving kids with daycare equals freedom. (laughs) Staying home to raise a family that loves you and needs you equals slavery. Now, there are times where, especially in Southern California, men and women, in order to survive, we both work. Jen and I have had that, had that season, right? For quite a few years, when Joey and Haven were little, she was working at Kaiser, and uh, the way we spent time together is I'd load up those two little munchkins, and we'd meet her on her dinner break, really, because she was on the graveyard shift. And we'd go spend time with her at the park near Kaiser in Anaheim. We did what we had to do. But then we got to the point where we're like, Lord, this is, not, this is not good for our family. We don't know how we're going to make it financially. But Lord, we need you to provide for us so Jen can raise our kids the way we want to. And I can work. And so we made that decision. And I still don't know how we made it. But we made it. And it was one of the best decisions we made. Right now, if there's a woman who wants to pursue a career and all that, there's nothing biblically that says you can't. Proverbs 31 talks about the godly woman, how she's resourceful and she starts her own business and she does all these things to care for the family. Everything is to serve the family, right? So there is that aspect there. But there is an aspect where if you're raising children, if you can, and and the woman understands the, the amazing responsibility and gift of being a mom, our world has crushed women and told women who stay at home they're not valuable because they're not in the workforce. That's an unbiblical perspective. Women, there's nothing wrong with a young girl going, you know what, I want to grow up and I want to be a godly wife and a godly mom. Go for it. Encourage them, right? Now, if you find yourself in a working situation, you want to do that then continue to seek the Lord and pray and glorify him in your job and your jobs together. God may have an amazing plan in that. But if you're longing to be free from that, 
and to be at home, then husband and wife need to be on the same page for that too and see what God has. But you see this design. Woman was given to man. God didn't put her in the garden to work it. He put the man in the garden and then gave her as a helper fit and corresponding. Did she help with the work in the garden? Absolutely she did. They were a team. And that's the thing I want to really emphasize more than anything tonight is the team aspect of what marriage is supposed to be. Now, there is leadership that's needed. Can we agree? Right. If you look at the Bible, you would not, it wouldn't be too hard to prove that the man is meant to be the leader of the home. Why would I say that? Man was created first. Woman was created for man. Man was given the responsibility to work the garden and keep it. And God gave the commandment to him when the woman wasn't around. So how did the woman learn the one commandment God gave? Adam needed to tell her. Adam was the priest who gave God's word to God's people. Adam was responsible for the spiritual leadership of his wife and their future kids. One of the greatest problems in the church today is men understanding their responsibility to lead spiritually. Like, well, my wife's known the Lord longer than me. I don't know what to do. Pray. Pray with your wife. Find time to read together. Talk about the scriptures together. Talk about your life in a biblical context. Found your life on Christ. When we sang that first song today, I'm gonna make it through because my house is built on you. Christ, our firm foundation. That is the heart and soul of a successful marriage is that Christ is that foundation. Jen said to me during worship, she goes, I love this song. It's like build your house on the rock and not on the sandy land in the adult version. And it really is. It is that biblical parable that Jesus talked about not building your house on the sand, but upon the rock. Many of us find ourselves here today because maybe there's aspects of our marriages that have been built upon the sandy land not built upon the foundation of Christ. And so we're going to see, and I'm going to give you like the really abridged version of Genesis 3. And this is what happened. They're in the garden. Suddenly Eve starts talking to a serpent or the serpent starts talking to her. Now we know that that's Satan in the form of a serpent. Now here's the thing, ladies. If a snake starts talking to you, don't talk to it. Biblical principle, right? There's all kinds of snakes out there and usually it's another guy. So don't talk to those guys. Don't let them whisper things to you and change your viewpoint of things. But Satan ended up asking her about the tree. Doesn't it look good? And going on in this conversation, she was, oh, well, no. She saw that it was good for food. And then she said, no, I can't take of it because the day... If I touch it, I will surely die. Now, here's the problem with that. God said the day you eat of it, you will die. That's what he told Adam. Eve got the translation wrong. Either Adam communicated it wrong or she understood it wrong. Either way, she said, well, if I touch it, I'm going to die. No, God said, if you eat it, you'll die. So there's that discrepancy and how God's word is communicated. So now I imagine her going out and touching it and she didn't die. God's word's wrong. It looks good. So then she took on herself the right to determine good and evil for her and for her husband. Now here's where Adam is responsible. Eve was solely responsible, first of all, or primarily because she disobeyed God's command and she ate of the fruit. We know that Adam was nearby. Could it be that Adam heard this conversation? That Adam was curious? That he decided to be passive in their marriage and be like, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it does look good. I'm going to let her try it out. And if she's still alive, then maybe I'll take some of it. (laughs) Right? Letting her be the sacrificial guinea pig here. But that could have been very well the thing. And here's the encouragement for us men. Some of us men tend to be a bit passive 
and unwilling to make decisions in our marriage because if it goes wrong, we don't want to hear I told you so or we don't want to be the reason why things went south. So then we don't make a decision. And to not make a decision is making a decision, isn't it? And so then we unfairly put that on our wives so now they feel the need to take up the mantle of leadership, make the decision while we watch. That's failed leadership. I've done it. I've done it in 25 years. I don't know how many times, but way more times than I wish I would have where I didn't make decisions when I needed to because I was scared of making a mistake. But then I put the weight on Jen and then she's going to have a hard time with me. But she's like, I don't want to make this decision. Like, why don't you step up and make it, right? Now, I've had to learn that over the years to make those decisions and to own the result. If it goes south, yeah, it's my fault. Sometimes if we don't seek the Lord, those decisions aren't made very well. But we could seek the Lord and still sometimes make a decision. We're like, man, I wish I wouldn't have made that decision. But a man takes responsibility for his family. A man says, you know what? Ultimately, I'm responsible. And here's what I mean by it. God ended up punishing Eve for her actions. God then punished Adam for his actions and hers. Why? Because Adam was ultimately responsible for the marriage. If you want to know who is the biggest game changer in a marriage... It's not based on value because they're equal value. It's based on responsibility and authority. The man is the biggest game changer. Not because he's better. He's more responsible. And that's why so many marriages are suffering is because us as men, we've been too weak, too passive, and not walking with Jesus. We need to put our wives before ourselves. And if we're willing to do that, our wives are natural responders. If you are laying down your life for your wife, you will be amazed at how freely she gives herself in service to you and the family. It's amazing. Ladies, you are amazing in how God has created you. And we as men, instead of getting frustrated with you because you're different, we need to understand better. And here's the thing. God wants you men to understand your wives. And I know some of you are thinking, God must really be a miracle worker if he can get me to understand my wife. <laughs> right? He is. He is. You can understand them. They're a beautiful mystery. And if you understood your wife in every way, honestly, you'd get bored. Do we understand God in every way? No, there's mystery. He is fascinating. And it causes us coming back for more and pursuing him. Why do you think, men, we don't fully grasp the beauty of our wives and how they think and feel and act? Because they are a beautiful mystery that God wants us to understand more and more. And the more you die to yourself, the more you will understand how they work and what they need to flourish. It's an amazing gift we have. And ladies, you get to model what really the church is like and how the church serves Christ in its beauty and how Christ dies for the church and lifts her up and exalts her to that place of importance. We see that in Ephesians 5. And I'm going to encourage you to go home and look at it. Um, I don't have time tonight to get into the curses that happened after the fall, but that's where all the conflict comes from, just so you know. Because there's a division between God and man. Enmity, which means hatred. There is a division between woman and man. And man now has difficulty in his labors and his work. Okay, we see all of that in Genesis 3. It's really fascinating. Um, I might comment on it a little bit next week. But I encourage you, go home, whether you're single or married. I want you to read Genesis 3. And I want you to read Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 gives amazing um, encouragement to wives and to husbands. But I want you to pay attention to all the verses 
that come before the instructions to wives and the instructions to husbands, okay? So Genesis 3 and Ephesians 5, all right? Any questions, anything not clear before I wrap it up? Trevor, what do you got? <laughs> that could have been. That could have been. Absolutely. <laughs> Plow the field and he just can't reach her in time. No phone. Yep, that's right. No phone. Yep. Yep, very well. Yep. Anybody else? I knew we'd get through all four passages tonight. All right. Why don't we stand? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the foundation for marriage that we got to just touch on tonight. Uh, but Lord, I pray that you would encourage each and every person who's here. If they're single, if they're married, whatever it may be, Lord, I pray that we would have a deeper and fuller understanding, Lord, of the beauty and majesty of this marriage covenant that you have made. We know, Jesus, that you are what makes our marriages work. You are what is necessary and needed in our relationships. And that as the closer we grow to Christ, we go closer, grow closer to our spouse. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, this time tonight and in the coming weeks would cause us to really grow in our understanding of you, of marriage, and of our spouses. May we show them the love that you have given us and may you be glorified in our relationships and for those who are single in their future relationships and marriage. If, they, if that is your calling upon them, then may they, Lord, marry that person that you have for them and glorify you with them together. And Lord, for those who have gone through marriage and have no interest at this time of getting married again, may you bring healing, Lord, from what they've gone through in maybe previous marriages. May you bring healing and understanding and restoration, Lord, in their relationship with you and their understanding of their own history and all that you have done through it. May you be glorified in all of us tonight, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming.